After months of working non-stop with barely a moment to myself, I finally decided I needed to get away from it all and regroup. The daily grind of my corporate job was burning me out, and I could feel myself getting more irritable and exhausted by the day. A weekend camping trip in the serene wilderness was just what I needed to clear my head. I researched some remote camping locations in the Rocky Mountains, wanting to really immerse myself in nature, away from cell service and other people. I eventually settled on a spot deep in the Wemenuche wilderness, near the junction of the Los Pinos and Piedra rivers. According to the map, it was at least a six-mile hike through rough terrain to reach the camping area I had chosen. Perfect, I thought. This would guarantee the solitude I was craving. After requesting a few days off and getting my gear together, I loaded up my trusty Subaru Outback early one Saturday morning and began the long drive from Denver out to the Wemenuche Wilderness Trailhead. The drive took me south through Colorado Springs before turning west towards the towering San Juan Mountains. I soaked in the dramatic mountain scenery as the paved roads turned to gravel, then dirt, taking me farther and farther from civilization. By early afternoon I had reached the Wemenuche Wilderness Trailhead, little more than a small clearing for parking with a register box and bulletin board. The parking area was empty except for one other vehicle, an older model 4Runner covered in dust and trail stickers. Looks like I wouldn't be entirely alone out here, though the other camper was likely miles away in another valley. I parked, signed the register, hoisted my heavy pack onto my shoulders, locked the car, and set off down the trail leading into the wilderness area. My shoulders immediately protested under the weight of my pack, which I had loaded down with seven days worth of food, water, first aid supplies, and other gear. I would need to be fully self-sufficient out here. The trail immediately switched back steeply uphill into the forest of pine and aspen. My heart rate quickened as I focused on my footing over roots and loose rocks breathing in the crisp mountain air scented with pine and sage. This challenging hike was just what I needed to take my mind off work and everything else. Out here it was just me and the wilderness, exactly as I wanted it. I hiked for several hours, stopping occasionally for water and to catch my breath. As the sun sank lower, the trees cast lengthening shadows across the trail. I pushed myself to make it at least three miles before losing daylight. Just as I was beginning to think about finding a campsite, the trail crested a rise and opened up to reveal the confluence of two rivers ahead. Across one river, a large open meadow spread out, ringed by forest and sweeping mountain vistas. This is it, I thought. My home for the next week. I made my way down the trail to the rivers, scanning the meadow for the best tent spot. I chose a flat area beneath some trees on the meadow's edge, with a constructed rock fire ring, signaling it was an established camping area. This spot would perfectly lend itself to relaxing by an evening fire. And the view couldn't be beat, a front row seat to the surrounding valley and mountains that glowed purple as the sun set. By the time I had my tent pitched and gear arranged, it was nearly dark. I quickly gathered firewood, cleared some rocks around the fire ring, and soon had a modest campfire burning. The exertion from the strenuous hike had made me ravenous. I heated up some water and cooked a pouch of freeze-dried camping food. As my dinner simmered, I sank down on a fallen log by the fire, breathing deep and taking in the scene. My shoulders relaxed, and I could feel my mind begin to clear already. Out here, distanced from everyday demands and stressors, I could finally think straight. Nothing mattered except fueling my body and settling in for the night. After devouring my meal, I tidied up my cookware and put any remaining food into a bag hoisted high up in a tree to keep bears from investigating my campsite. Darkness had fully enveloped the meadow now, the only light coming from my flickering campfire. The only sounds were the soft rush of the river and whispers of wind through the swaying trees. I was truly alone. The realization was both daunting and exhilarating. When I could barely keep my eyes open any longer, I extinguished my fire, washed up using water pumped from the stream, and retreated into my tent. I left the rain fly off my tent so I could stare up at the sea of glittering stars as I drifted off to sleep. Out here, 
Distanced from any light pollution, the Milky Way shone brighter than I had ever seen it. I took it all in for a few moments before exhaustion overtook me. Surrounded by the muted symphony of the wilderness at night, I fell into the deepest and most restorative sleep I'd had in months. The melodic chorus of the wilderness lulled me into a deep sleep within minutes. The soft babbling stream sounded like a lullaby, punctuated by the occasional hoot of an owl or rustle of wildlife in the forest. As I lay cocooned in my sleeping bag on the hard ground, the day's exhaustion overtook me. The strenuous hike had drained what little energy reserves I had left after months of overly caffeinated, stressed-out days chained to my desk. Out here, my mind had nothing left to do but power down and recover. As I drifted off, I hoped for dreams filled with aspen-lined ridges and endless alpine vistas. I thought about how, just beyond the walls of my flimsy nylon tent, all sorts of creatures were stirring under the cover of darkness. Perhaps a bear wandered through the camp, catching my scent but lumbering onward. A mountain lion might slink through the high grasses in pursuit of a rabbit, paying me no mind. And countless smaller animals like foxes and raccoons went about their nighttime routines. But in my rapidly descending drowsiness, these thoughts of what lurked outside barely registered. I felt remarkably safe, ensconced in my sleeping bag, lured into the magical oblivion of deep wilderness sleep. A place with no deadlines, inbox notifications or demanding bosses to trigger my fight-or-flight response. Out here I could simply be, letting my conscious mind dissolve into the darkness. Even when I briefly surfaced into semi-consciousness hours later, noticing the dying fire and chill mountain air nipping at my cheeks, I immediately sunk back down into sleep's embrace. The world outside could wait. For now, my mind and body were recharging at long last, replenishing themselves after being pushed to the brink of exhaustion. I had arrived depleted, but the wilderness was already working its magic. Sleep came easy for the first night in ages. My breathing slowed, my muscles relaxed, and I disappeared into blissful unconsciousness to the gentle lullaby of the forest. I jerked awake to the sound of a loud crack coming from somewhere outside my tent. In my groggy state, it took a moment to get my bearings. The inky darkness inside my tent was disorienting. Just as I had fallen into the deepest period of REM sleep, something had startled me back to consciousness. My heart pounded as I lay frozen inside my sleeping bag, ears straining. Had I dreamt the noise? No. There it was again. A sharp crack, then low crunching noises. Something large was moving right outside my tent. Adrenaline flooded my system and my mind switched to high alert, fully awake now. I frantically racked my brain to identify the source of the noise. A downed tree branch snapping under the weight of a large animal? An errant backpacker arriving late and clumsily navigating by headlamp? Surely something benign like a deer walking by? But no, the crunching noises were too loud and clumsy to be a graceful deer. As the cracks and snaps continued just paces from where my head lay, my mind leaped to the very real dangers that this rugged wilderness harbored. Bears, mountain lions, wolves. My heart hammered against my ribcage as grim possibilities raced through my mind. I had experienced animal encounters while camping before, but never while caught so vulnerable in my sleeping bag in the middle of the night. Fear and panic threatened to overwhelm me as I considered my dwindling options. I couldn't sit still and hope whatever was outside would just pass by harmlessly. But escaping my tent and scrambling off blindly into the night wasn't wise either. The gruesome cracking and snuffling continued, alternating with deep guttural pants. It seemed disconcertingly loud and close by. Whatever was out there was big, possibly hungry, and not bothered by human-scented tents. I braced myself for the possibility that at any moment, sharp claws and teeth could come tearing through my tent's nylon walls. Propelled by instinctive fear, I bolted upright inside my sleeping bag. My eyes strained against the inky blackness, blind without my headlamp. I sat motionless, every muscle tensed and ready to react. 
My breathing came in short, panicked gasps that I struggled to muffle. I couldn't let whatever was outside know I was awake and alert. Surprise would be my only advantage if it was indeed a dangerous predator. The gruesome cracking drifted through the still night air again. The noise was so out of place amidst the peaceful nocturnal sounds of the babbling stream and gentle wind. Something was very wrong here. I racked my adrenaline-flooded brain for an explanation, fighting the urge to panic. It didn't sound like the careless steps of a clumsy backpacker or deer. In fact, it didn't sound like footsteps at all. More like bones snapping. But what animal could make such an awful noise right here in camp? A truly chilling thought crept into my frantic mind. What if the noise wasn't an animal at all? We were miles beyond any help or witnesses. What if somewhere in these vast mountains, cut off from society, a depraved person had made a remote camp their haunt? Bile rose in my throat as my imagination supplied grisly possibilities. No, I couldn't let my mind go down that road. Surely no human could move through the forest making such grotesque cracking and crunching sounds. It had to be an animal. Unless... Unless it wasn't an animal either, but some... Thing. Else entirely. Some creature not of this earth. Anxious goosebumps broke out across my clammy skin at the thought. But I couldn't indulge these wild speculations. The noises persisted, demanding some rational reaction. I cupped my trembling hands over my mouth and nose to disguise the sounds of my panicked breathing. Sitting rigidly upright inside my sleeping bag, I strained my ears against the darkness, willing the thing outside to reveal its origins. The creature, whatever it was, seemed unaware of my presence. But that could change at any moment. I hear more cracking noises, like bones breaking. The gut-wrenching cracking sounds continued just outside the nylon walls of my tent. Inside, I sat paralyzed with fear, scarcely allowing myself to breathe. The noises were too gruesome to be the snapping of twigs or rustling of brush. Each crack was different, sometimes dry and brittle, other times sinewy, almost wet. A very visceral, primitive part of my brain understood. Those were the sounds of bones being snapped and sucked of marrow. Nausea and dread threatened to overwhelm me. What nightmarish creature had wandered into my camp, feasting so casually just steps away? Had it already made a meal of some poor creature before coming to investigate my tent? Bile rose in my throat as I envisioned the bloody scene that must lay just beyond the flimsy barrier of my tent. Some detached part of my mind again desperately hoped for a rational explanation. Perhaps a bear had caught a deer, dragging it back to camp to feast safely away from the competition. But again, the sounds were all wrong, not the greedy gorging of a bear. The crunching and slurping showed intelligence and purpose, not animal instinct. Something sentient was out there, taking its time to relish each sickening crack. I shuddered, imagining it expertly picking flesh from bones before casually snapping them open to lap up the marrow inside. Fear rooted me in place, inhibited only by morbid curiosity. I needed to see what this malevolent thing was, and confirm it wasn't some twisted figment of my imagination. Could such evil actually exist, wandering the lonely mountain darkness? The cracking abruptly ceased, leaving only the gentle murmur of the stream. A deafening silence descended, broken only by the frantic hammering of my heart. The predatory thing had paused, but I had no doubt it remained right outside. Perhaps it had detected my presence after all. I sat petrified, praying the fragile tent walls would conceal me, buying time to formulate some plan of escape or defense. But before I could collect my scattered thoughts, the grisly snapping resumed with renewed vigor. Whatever was out there remained wholly fixated on its unholy meal. Nervously, I unzip my tent and peek outside. My morbid curiosity finally overpowered my fear. I needed to know what hellish thing lurked just beyond the wafer-thin nylon walls of my tent. As the awful cracking continued unabated, I realized no help would arrive to scare the beast away. 
I was utterly alone. If I stayed paralyzed inside my sleeping bag waiting for dawn, it could easily make a meal of me next. Moving slowly so as to not rustle the tent walls, I took a deep, shaky breath and reached for the tent zipper. I pried it open millimeter by millimeter, trying not to let the teeth snag on the fabric. Any sudden sound could alert the feeding creature mere feet away. Finally, a six-inch opening gaped at the bottom of the tent door, just wide enough to peer out. The night beyond was a wall of impenetrable blackness. No moon or stars penetrated the thick forest canopy high above. As my eyes strained against the dark, the ghastly cracking sounds seemed to grow even louder and closer, reverberating through my bones. How could the thing not hear my ragged, panicked breathing by now? Surely it could detect my terror, smell my fear like an irresistible perfume. Bracing myself, I gingerly shifted forward onto my knees and grasped my headlamp from where it lay atop my discarded hiking boots. My fingers trembled as I tightened the strap around my shaking head. I took one last steadying breath, feeling as if I balanced on a precipice between a known reality and an unfathomable nightmare. Before my nerve failed me, I reached for the headlamp switch. In the split second before the LEDs flared to life, the ghastly cracking paused, as if in anticipation of finally glimpsing its gruesome perpetrator. Shielding my eyes against the blinding beam, I leaned my face towards the narrow gap at the base of the tent door and looked outside. In the glow of the dying fire, I see a tall, skinny humanoid creature crouched by the fire, eating something. As my eyes adjusted, I zeroed in on the dying campfire and the creature hunched over it. Terror seized my pounding heart as the creature's outline came into focus. A tall, rail-thin humanoid figure folded nearly double over a small, dark mass. My headlamp reflected off its slick black eyes as it lifted its face from its meal to squint into the light. Its features were horribly human-like, but elongated and distorted. The pale flesh of its bald head was pulled tight across an angular skull. Its mouth, smeared with dark fluids, contained a jumble of long, jagged teeth. My light followed the curve of its unnaturally bent spine down to where it hunched beside the faintly glowing coals. The scarred flesh of its elongated limbs was stretched thin over protruding bones. It looked starved and skeletal, though its distended belly sagged heavy and full beneath its ribs. Full from consuming whatever poor creature lay mangled between its feet. As I watched paralyzed with horror, it returned to its meal. With chilling purpose, it twisted a rodent-like appendage until the dry snap of bone punctured the silence. My stomach heaved at the wet, sucking sounds as it noisily slurped marrow from the shattered bone. Just a dozen yards from where I sat frozen behind the tent door, bile rose in my throat. This was no bear or mountain lion. Some twisted vestige of humanity lurked beneath its withered flesh. But there was no humanity in its depthless eyes. My light wobbled as terrified tremors coursed through my body. The image of that hideous feasting creature is seared into my mind. Hands shaking violently, I grab the tent zipper and wrench it upwards with a rush of panic. I seal the door tight and scramble backward until I hit the far nylon wall, desperate to put distance between myself and the monster outside. My whole body trembles uncontrollably as I huddle in my sleeping bag. I squeeze my eyes shut, but all I see is the creature. That thing was no natural forest predator. Some twisted human features lurked beneath its withered flesh. But no humanity resided in its empty black eyes. Fighting nausea, I wrap my arms around my knees and try to melt back into the tent wall. Canvas and nylon feel woefully flimsy now, with only blood-soaked dirt and nightmarish evil lurking inches beyond. I strain my ears for any sound of it approaching, but hear nothing over my own panicked whimpers. That thing could tear open my tent with ease whenever it pleased. I'm utterly trapped and defenseless. Oh God, what have I stumbled into? This was supposed to be a peaceful retreat into nature. 
Tears burn my eyes as I accept how utterly alone I am. No one knows I'm out here. No park ranger or fellow camper will come by to help. I've never felt so small and terrified. Curled in a quaking ball inside my sleeping bag, I desperately try to make sense of what I just witnessed. Some logical part of my brain claws for a rational explanation. A rabid bear? Deranged mountain man? I squeeze my eyes shut, wanting to reject the reality of what I saw. Maybe altitude sickness was making me hallucinate? I had read wilderness solitude could do strange things to the mind, but the image of that creature is seared too vividly in my memory, and the awful sounds had been all too real. No simple hallucination could explain the primal fear I felt in its presence. As I lie paralyzed inside my tent, my mind flashes through legends I had scoffed at before tonight. Old folktales are passed down through generations of the Navajo and Ute tribes who once inhabited this valley. Sinister shapeshifters and bloodthirsty skinwalkers. The Wendigo, that emaciated demon of insatiable hunger. I had dismissed them as quaint myths, scary stories to thrill around a campfire. But felt in my bones, some truth lurked in those old warnings, never to wander the mountains alone at night. In the dark pine-scented recesses, long divorced from modern reason, primal evils still roamed. And I had foolishly stumbled right into their domain. I can't resist another glimpse. Holding my breath, I crack open the tent once more. The creature remains hunched by the fading fire. It picks greedily at the scattered carcass between its feet, oblivious to me. Everything about its physiology seems slightly misaligned, its proportions not quite human. It hunches over its meal like a mantis, limbs twisted unnaturally, joints bending the wrong way. As it tears sinew from bone with its teeth, its face disappears inside the animal's ribcage. My gut churns at the wet tearing sounds punctuating the quiet night. I should look away, but I'm locked in place. My blood turns to ice. The creature suddenly stops feeding and goes still. Wrenching its face from the ragged carcass, it turns slowly towards my tent. Its bald head cocks at an unnatural angle as if detecting my fearful stare. My heart leaps into my throat under that soulless gaze. Those sunken eyes smolder like hot coals in the shadows. I'm instantly reminded of stories told around countless campfires of glowing red demon eyes peering from the darkness. But I had laughed them off as creative fiction, a metaphorical warning not to mistake wild animals for monsters. Now I know the truth. The red-eyed devils of folklore are real, and one is looking right at me. My muscles lock up, unsure whether to remain still or run. The creature doesn't move, continuing to stare right at me with those smoldering coals for eyes. It makes no sound, and doesn't even seem to breathe. We remain frozen for endless seconds, each waiting for the other to make the first move. As the night air grows heavy with tension, every fiber of my being wants to bolt from this demonic entity. But some instinct warns me not to trigger its predatory instincts. Our silent stalemate drags on, the only sound of my drumming heart. Those fiery eyes pin me like an insect beneath the glass. I feel utterly exposed in my tent. It knows I'm here now. I can only pray dawn comes before it decides to end our standoff. When the creature moves its spindly arm, I gasp involuntarily. Its mouth splits open revealing rows of jagged teeth meant for nothing but tearing flesh. My brain screams run, I drop the tent flap and dive backward, heart hammering. I cower in my sleeping bag, clamping a shaking hand over my mouth to muffle panicked whimpers. I prayed desperately it didn't actually see or hear me. Maybe it was only investigating the disturbance, not acting on hostile intentions. But its burning eyes had seemed to stare right into my soul. I strain my ears for any sign it's approaching the tent, but hear nothing except the frantic pounding of my heart. Maybe it's lost interest and returned to its feast. But I don't dare peek out again to check, lest I draw its attention once more. 
I can only wait coiled inside my sleeping bag, dreading the sound of claws scraping nylon. I try to control my panicked breathing, taking measured breaths despite the terror flooding my body with adrenaline. I need to think. I can't let fear overwhelm me. My flight reflex is screaming at me to run blindly into the night, but I force myself to stay put. That thing is between me and the trail, and I wouldn't get far running shoeless through the woods in the dark. If I can't run to safety, I need some way to defend myself. Fighting the urge to stay paralyzed inside my sleeping bag, I search around with trembling hands until my fingers close on the handle of my camping knife. The six-inch blade seems pitiful against the monster outside, but it's better than nothing. Staring down at the knife, my mind races through every self-defense move I've ever learned. None seems sufficient if that thing decides to rip through my tent, but I won't go down quietly. Grasping the knife with white knuckles, I try to still my galloping heart. I'm ready to fight for my life if that demon comes for me. With my knife clutched tightly in my fist, I work up the courage to peek outside again. I gingerly lift the tent flap, braced for the glow of hellish eyes. But as my headlamp cuts through the darkness, I see nothing but the faint outline of trees. The meadow is still and quiet, with no sign of the feeding creature. I sweep my beam across the dying campfire, finding only the gnawed animal remains scattered around the periphery. The creature must have slipped off into the forest to digest its meal. But I don't fool myself into thinking it's gone for good. I scan the tree line, wondering if its black eyes are staring back from the shadows, toying with me. The silence presses in from all sides, no crickets chirping, no owls hooting. Even the wind seems to have died. It's as if the whole forest holds its breath, also dreading the creature's return. With my knife clutched in a sweaty grip, I unzip the tent just wide enough to crawl outside. I have to find signs of where it went and make sure it's not lurking just out of sight. Knife raised, I step out into the choking darkness. Slowly I emerge from my tent, knife ready, and search for any sign of the creature. Heart hammering, I sweep my headlamp in a slow arc around the campsite. My ragged breaths seem deafening, breaking the stillness. I expect the creature to leap from the shadows at any moment, but I'm met only by silence. Stepping as lightly as I can in my clumsy hiking boots, I move toward the remains of the fire. The creature's victim looks to have been a small deer or sheep. Tufts of coarse fur cling to ragged strips of skin and splintered bones. My guts twist at the unnatural angles of the broken limbs where it has feasted. I scan the surrounding forest, but find no trails or traces leading away from camp. Crouching slowly, I search for footprints or markings in the dirt. But the ground is trampled and blood-soaked from its meal. If it left tracks, they are lost among the carnage. I spin my headlamp beam over each tree and bush, eyes straining for claws or mottled flesh, but find no signs of where the demon has gone. It has simply vanished back into the unfathomable wilderness. Out there, it moves stealthily through paths no human knows. Fighting panic, I back up toward my tent, knife poised to strike. Back inside my tent, heart still racing, I replay what I witnessed. The image of that gangly creature feasting beside my campfire is seared into my mind. I can still smell the iron tang of blood mixed with wood smoke clinging to the air. Looking out again, I take in the full horror it left behind. The ravaged carcass, just a lump of coarse fur and shattered bones now, lies only yards from where I slept. It's a miracle the sounds didn't wake me earlier. Sticky dark fluids soak into the dirt around the remains, tracing where it dragged the poor beast into camp to feed. I stare into the empty forest, half expecting to see its hunched form stalking between the trees. But the woods are still. Somehow it has slipped away just as stealthily as it arrived, leaving only the carnage strewn around my camp to prove I didn't imagine the whole nightmare. But I know, viscerally, that it's out there somewhere, under the cover of night. 
and that it will return. My only hope is to escape this cursed place at first light. I won't spend another night at its mercy. I duck back into my tent, zip it tight, and huddle sleepless until dawn, knife clutched close as my only defense against the horrors roaming these mountains. Part of me wants to cut my losses and flee this cursed place, racing blind down the trail until I collapse from exhaustion or hit civilization. But attempting to hike out now, in the dead of night, would be suicide. Without gear or lights, I'd be easy prey for both natural predators and whatever unnatural evil roams these woods. Exhaustion and fear would leave me stumbling helpless in the dark. As much as I ache to flee, I know my best chance is to wait for dawn's light before making my escape. Come daybreak, I will pack as quickly as possible and retrace my steps out of this valley, not stopping until I reach my car. Let it have my campsite, I just desperately need to escape its reach. Until then, I have no choice but to endure the remaining nightmarish hours here, jumping at every rustle and crackle from the forest. All I can do is grip my knife and pray for sunrise. I sit frozen inside my tent, eyes strained wide against the darkness. Adrenaline courses through my veins, screams at me to run, even though I know fleeing blindly into the woods would mean certain death. Staying put goes against every instinct. But I force myself to remain still and quiet, listening intently past my own shuddering breaths. The faintest crack or rustle makes my heart seize. Every minute that passes without hearing its approach helps bolster my courage. Can it really be gone? As the hours drag on, I gradually begin to pray that it has slunk back into whatever hellish crevice it crawled out of for the night. Perhaps, like other predators, once it has fed its bloodlust subsides for a time. But morning is still an eternity away. I white-knuckle my knife and remain poised to fight or run. Curled in the corner of my tent, eyes wide and fixed on the barely parted zipper, I keep endless watch for a return of the creature that may stalk these woods eternally. Eventually, dawn finally arrives, and I force myself to closely examine the carcass by the cold fire pit. Crouching down, I see it was a young deer, its rib cage cracked open and leg bones shredded. Dried blood stains the dirt and mats the coarse fur. The poor thing's head is completely missing. I search the surrounding area for any tracks or signs of what dragged it here, but find nothing definitive. No footprints or claw marks show the creature's path. It's as if the deer's mutilated body appeared here by magic. Picking through the bones with a stick, I search for any clues about what the creature was. The leg bones are splintered at unnatural angles, far too large to snap using just hands. No other animal tracks surround the area. I'm utterly perplexed. A bear or mountain lion would have left traces and made quick work of the carcass. This careful picking of the bones suggested intelligence and purpose that no wild animal possesses. But finding no answers in the remains, I can only shake my head and continue dismantling the camp. The bones and fur make me think it was some kind of animal, but larger than any I know of. Studying the carcass filled me with dread. No normal predator could have slaughtered it so meticulously right in my campsite. The creature hadn't simply killed for food. It had toyed with the deer, carefully extracted marrow while leaving much of the meat untouched. The alarming power needed to cleanly snap those thick bones hinted at something far larger than any mountain lion or wolf. I thought back to bears, but even grizzlies didn't display that level of intelligence when feeding. And the sounds I heard in the night, that purposeful cracking, was no mere animal. Some primal intuition warns me not to search too closely for answers about what unholy presence defiled this camp. No good can come from pulling too much at the sinister mystery of what I witnessed. It's beyond rational understanding. The only sensible option is to flee these cursed woods and leave the creature be. But as I pack my gear, I can't resist scanning the tree line repeatedly, searching for watching eyes. 
Some demonic specter from times before records and reason still lingers out there, concealed by the silent pines. It haunts these ancient mountains, and I'm afraid a glimpse of it may haunt me too from here on out. Fleeing that campsite isn't enough to calm my racing mind. I search the surrounding forest obsessively for any sign of where the creature came from or returned to after its grisly meal. In the harsh light of day, it's hard to believe the horror I witnessed the night before was anything but a twisted dream. But I need concrete proof. I shine my headlamp beam into the spaces between the towering pines and rocky overhangs. I search for claw marks, strange prints, anything to prove something besides wild animals have passed this way. But the bird song and grass gently waving in the breeze betray nothing unnatural. By the time the trail descends back into the valley, I've found no evidence of the creature. No sulfur stench or entrails dangling from branches. Just the benign forest I imagined before this hike became a waking nightmare. But I know evil doesn't vanish with the rising sun. It just lurks deeper in the shadows. I quicken my pace, suddenly desperate to be around people again. To reassure myself that there's still goodness and reason in this world, not just prehistoric evil roaming the spaces beyond civilization's reach. Back to where streetlights banish the darkness, keeping the demonic past at bay. But I know part of me will always strain to hear ominous sounds over my shoulder, wondering if it's out there still. Finally back in cell range after a tense hike out, I grapple with what to do next. Part of me knows I should tell the authorities something unnatural is lurking up there, if only to warn others away. But the reasonable part of my brain screams that I'll sound utterly insane trying to convince them I crossed paths with some ravenous demon in the woods. They'll chalk it up to a bad dream, exhaustion, letting my imagination run away from me out in the wilderness alone. It would be my word against, well, nothing. I have no proof beyond the fragmented bones and dried blood I left behind. No photos or tracks to back up my wild claims. Who would believe such a fantastic story without evidence? Even I'm struggling to make sense of what I saw as I put more distance between myself and that cursed valley. Maybe it's better to chalk it up to a delusion and simply vow to never camp alone again. Perhaps forgetting would be wiser than inviting ridicule and worry by sharing my impossible tale. Maybe silence is the only way such dark knowledge can be handled. By leaving it buried forever in that remote place where nightmares prowl. I play out the various scenarios in my mind. I could tell the ranger who patrols the trailhead, but I know how improbable my story sounds. With no photos or tracks or any real proof, I have a feeling he'd smile politely while reaching for the number of the nearest mental health facility. I can already imagine him telling others later about the clearly unstable hiker who spun some yarn about a monster in the woods. Word would spread, and soon I'd be known as just another delusional eccentric unable to handle being alone in the wilderness. Maybe I could anonymously share my experience on a hiking forum, but even that poses risks. In the age of IP addresses and digital footprints, anonymity is never guaranteed. And what if other hikers venture out there trying to find proof themselves, only to also stumble into mortal danger? Could I live with that guilt? No, without any evidence, keeping this to myself seems the only option. Let people go on believing wilderness monsters are only metaphors, figments of overactive imaginations. The human mind can't comprehend such eldritch horrors anyway. Reality must remain undisturbed by such dark knowledge. It's better if what I encountered out there stays buried unseen, like an ancient beast slumbering deep beneath the mountain's rocky bones. Some things people were not meant to witness. Now I understand why certain secrets are kept by those wise enough to shelter humanity from what lurks at the fringes. After much debate, I opt to continue my planned backpacking route, partly as a way to prove, both to myself and to the watching wilderness, that I refuse to be so easily intimidated. I won't let this sinister encounter disrupt my life. I'll finish this trip on my own terms, albeit with heightened caution. At the next campsite, I choose an open clearing with clear sightlines, avoiding anywhere densely wooded. 
I prepare an earlier dinner while the sunlight remains, then gather extra kindling to keep my fire brightly burning all evening. As darkness falls, I scan the night woods continually, looking and listening for anything out of place. Resting in my tent, I sleep in fitful patches rather than drifting off fully. Any snapped branch or rustle jolts me upright, grasping my knife in white-knuckled fists. But the expected attack never comes. The creature seems confined to that lone, cursed valley for now. In subsequent days on the trail, I find myself starting at every unexpected sound. The cry of a hawk makes my heart lurch, I scan the sky anxiously until identifying the source. When a branch cracks loudly under some unseen weight, I freeze, listening intently with widened eyes. But it always ends up being some benign forest creature foraging or settling down for the night. A deer grazing nearby, its tail swishing at flies. The scuttle of squirrels playing chase up a tree. Nothing that fully explains the inexplicable sounds that set me so on edge. I tell myself I'm just jumpy after the frightening encounter. This hike is turning me paranoid, making me hear danger where there is none. In the reassuring light of day, nothing seems amiss in the lush green forests and meadows surrounding the trail. It's only as dusk approaches that my nerves start to fray once more. As the days wear on, I can't shake the sense of being watched from the shadowy woods flanking the trail. Often, at the very edge of my vision, I swear I see subtle movement in the trees. A flutter, a blur, barely discernible from the sway and flicker of branches in my periphery. But each time I whip my head around to stare directly, I find nothing out of the ordinary. Just still pines and quivering aspens. It happens over and over this game of seeing ghosts I can't quite catch. I pivot and peer hard into the underbrush where my instincts insist something hides, observing me. But nothing ever resolves out of the play of light and shadow. By the time I stop for the night, I'm exhausted from being on constant high alert. I tell myself it's just stress fracturing my focus, making me see monsters in every quiver and rustle that nothing tangible is stalking me through the remote mountain forests. But as I scan the darkness before settling uneasily into sleep, some deeper instinct whispers that primordial horrors lurk just out of sight, haunting wild lands long abandoned by humanity's fragile reason and light. The setting sun drags my nerves tight as a bowstring. I gather extra kindling and build a larger fire than needed, unwilling to tolerate even a moment of darkness. I make sure my tent is pitched with the flap positioned where I have a clear view of the surrounding campsite. Inside, I sit awake, turning my knife over in my hands as the flames cast flickering shadows across the nylon walls. I try occupying my mind by cleaning my gear, reading trail guides, and doing anything to pass the night hours until I exhaust myself into fitful sleep. But inevitably, I find myself observing the darkness watching for shapes taking form in the black void beyond my campfire's reach. I strain my ears for any sound out of place with the typical night murmurs. But nothing seems amiss. Just my overactive imagination, I keep telling myself. Yet I can't shake the sense of lurking danger, the feeling of unseen eyes watching me from the forest. This land feels haunted by something ancient and hungry, still roaming the deepest mountain wilderness, while civilization sleeps unaware. So I keep my blade close and the fire bright, determined to make it through each endless night. It's my final night out on the trail before returning to civilization at last. Trying to relax at the campsite, I'm just starting to think the trip may conclude without further incident. But then, just after dusk, I hear the throaty crunching sound, so subtle yet instantly familiar. It saps the warmth from my bones like a douse of icy water. I go still, listening intently past the pounding of blood in my ears. The crunching continues intermittently. Something out there is feeding. Crack, crunch, crack. Slow, almost leisurely sounds of jaws crushing bone, extracting marrow. No rush, no urgency. 
the confident dining sounds of an apex predator totally at ease in its environment. The rationalizations and excuses I've made dissolve, leaving me exposed to a hard truth. Something inhumane walks these ancient forests, concealed by darkness. It has haunted me day and night on this trip. But tonight, my exhaustion is replaced by anger. I refuse to cower helplessly in my tent, awaiting dawn one last time. Gripping my knife, I stride out to finally glimpse the beast unobstructed. The cracking sounds continue from somewhere just beyond the reach of my firelight. With my knife clutched tightly, I creep out into the night, moving stealthily from tree to tree, closer to the unseen feeding. I wait for the monster to explode from the underbrush, to feel its claws tear into me at last, but the forest remains calm. Reaching the outer edge of light near the sounds, I pause behind a wide pine, take a deep breath, and crane my neck slowly around the trunk. In a small clearing just ahead, a large elk lies on its side, legs shattered. And there, with its back to me, the creature hunches over the carcass, blocking most of the elk from view as it feasts. I should retreat silently, but rage roots me in place. Tightening my grip on the knife, I creep forward, determined to face the thing head on. Suddenly, I step on a branch and it cracks loudly underfoot, making me freeze. The creature stills, then slowly looks over its shoulder directly at me, eyes burning red in the shadows. Suddenly, the fires snap, breaking the spell of adrenaline-fueled courage I'm under. I glance back and see the flames have burned down dangerously low, barely casting light anymore. How long have I been away from camp, chasing phantom sounds in the dark? Too long, I realize with a shudder. I've let this obsessive pursuit lure me away from safety and reason. Shame washes over me as the angry bravado fades, leaving childish embarrassment in its wake. What did I plan to do if some mythical monster appeared? Stab it with my little pocket knife? Feeling like a fool, I turn and hurry back to camp, nervously glancing over my shoulder. But nothing pursues me, just my own racing shadow fleeing before me. Back at the fire pit, I breathe a tense sigh of relief, then stir the embers back to life. The forest remains silent around me now, with no sounds of feeding carrying on the chilled night air. I shake my head, laughing shakily at my foolishness. Being alone in the wilderness has clearly warped my judgment and let imagination run rampant. In the calm fire glow, I feel the comfort of reason settling over me once more. The moment the first rays of dawn filter through the trees, I tear out of my tent, hurriedly packing up camp with shaking hands. I throw everything haphazardly into my pack, not even bothering to fold or organize items. My sole focus is to escape these woods as fast as humanly possible. I kick dirt over the smoldering fire, forego washing any dishes, and gulp down an energy bar as I scramble to take down my tent. The whole time I glance furtively over my shoulder, feeling unseen eyes watching me from the gloom beneath the trees. But no demonic creature comes slinking out of the shadows. For now. With gear strapped quickly to my pack, I take off down the trail at a near jog despite my exhaustion. I put as much distance between myself and that final campsite as I can, not slowing until my legs and lungs scream for rest. Only then do I risk a backward glance. Seeing nothing pursuing me, I continue my escape. I won't feel an ounce of relief until I'm off this mountain for good. My frantic pace continues as I traverse switchback after switchback down the mountain's spine. Despite my legs burning and my breath heaving, I don't dare slow down. The feeling of being tracked and hunted pushes me onward. From time to time I spot subtle shadows shifting in my peripheral vision. But when I pivot to look, there's nothing except still trees and stones. Still, the primal urge to flee doesn't abate. Some ancient instinct tells me the predatory presence still lurks nearby, toying with me, hurting me downhill. I glance over my shoulder so often I nearly trip over roots and rocks right beneath my feet. I know deep down, no sanctuary awaits at the trailhead. 
whatever evil haunts this untamed land cannot be outrun so easily. But still, I push myself harder, racing the sinking sun. I ignore my body's pleas to rest, sensing this is a race I can't afford to lose. If I don't hit that trailhead before darkness falls, I may never leave these woods again. With that grisly thought driving me like the crack of a whip, I plunge onward recklessly. Never have I been so eager to return to the civilized world. The trees thin out ahead, letting me know the trailhead is near. But relief remains at bay, the prickling sense of being tracked clinging like a burr I can't shake. I force my aching legs into a loping run again. Each time the trail bends out of view, dread wells inside me that the creature will drop onto the path, cutting off my escape. The forest seems to crowd in hungrily from all sides. I don't feel safe enough to glance back even for a second, sensing the presence nearly within striking distance. Is it hurting me? I wonder with rising panic, toying with me like a cat cornering a mouse. My mind fills with sudden certainty that its glowing red eyes are boring into my back from just paces behind. I push myself to an all-out sprint. I round a curve, and there ahead lies the trailhead bathed in heavenly sunlight. With a sob, I crash out from beneath the trees into the parking lot. I don't pause, just beeline right for my dusty car, fumbling keys from my pack with quaking fingers. I can still feel fiery eyes probing between my shoulder blades as I peel out, spewing gravel behind my spinning tires. I aim my car straight down the winding mountain road without glancing back. Only once I've put miles between myself and the forest do I dare breathe normally again. With distance, the tingling dread of being pursued begins fading. Still, I watch the rearview mirror closely half expecting to glimpse something loping after the car just within view. But I'm greeted only by the empty dirt road and the mirror growing smaller as I descend. The lower I get, the stronger the towers of cell service grow. I'm tempted to call someone just to confirm I'm still connected to the civilized world. But what would I say? So I just drive on in solitude. By the time the paved highway appears below, the wilderness feels lifetimes away. I made it out intact, it seems, though part of me whispers the creature allowed my escape. For now. It knows these ashen urban streets offer no refuge. The waxing moon still pulls the tides of unholy hunger. It will be waiting whenever I dare return to the wild reaches. But for today, civilization shields me from its watchful red eyes. I spot my dusty Subaru alone in the trailhead lot, like a life raft bobbing at sea. Fishing my keys out with trembling fingers, I waste no time tossing all my gear haphazardly into the trunk. Caution and organization will have to wait. Right now, I need distance. I squeeze the accelerator as the car bounces over the deeply rutted trail leading back to the pavement. My tires spit plumes of dust that cloud the rearview mirror, concealing any pursuers. Not that I dare check. My eyes stay glued ahead. The forest crowds claustrophobically down the steep mountain flanks as I take each hairpin curve recklessly fast. Any moment, a large creature could lunge out from the tree line, forcing me into a deadly skid. But somehow I stay on the treacherous dirt road, my knuckles bone white on the steering wheel. At long last, the paved highway appears ahead. I sob with relief at the sight of painted lines and widened lanes. As I turn onto the smooth asphalt, the vice grip of terror around my chest finally loosens. I made it. The further I get from the densely wooded mountain wilderness, the easier it becomes to breathe. As the forest gives way to rolling foothills and open ranch land, some of the tension eases from my white-knuckled grip on the steering wheel. The warm and open countryside makes the shadowy, close-pressed trees feel miles away. I crack the car windows and let the fresh air clear away the lingering piney scent of the mountains. Out here under the wide blue sky, the austere peaks feel less like a sanctuary and more like the imposing battlements of some gothic castle concealing ancient decay behind their facade. As livestock dotting the roadside pastures lift their heads placidly, 
the creature in the woods starts to feel more myth than memory. Just my overworked mind playing tricks, triggered by too many nights alone in the black forest. I cling to this rational thought like a talisman, warding off any lingering unease. The further civilization encroaches, the more last night's panic seems foolish. By the time I passed roadside diners and gas stations, I let myself believe the danger was just in my head. Despite my attempts at rational explanations, an instinctual dread lingers inside me, the bone-deep kind immune to the charms of reason and daylight. Some primal part of my spirit that still crouches by ancient fires knows what I witnessed in that wood defied sane understanding. Once I'm out of the mountains, I check into a motel to shower and change clothes. I don't feel fully at ease until I've reached the outskirts of the nearest town down in the lowlands. Only as the first budget motels appear along the roadside do I finally start to unwind my white-knuckled grip on the steering wheel. Civilization never looked so welcoming. I pull into the lot of the first motel I see, not caring that it looks worn down and dodgy. All that matters is putting a sturdy roof and locked door between myself and the mountain night. The board receptionist barely glances up as I book a ground floor room. I make a beeline right for the shower, scrubbing trails of dirt and stale sweat from my skin until the water turns ice cold. Dressing in clean clothes, I already feel half-human again. I order a pizza, suddenly ravenous after burning so much nervous energy. Only after devouring the entire thing do I collapse, exhausted, onto the lumpy mattress. In minutes I drift off, soothed by the muted sounds of traffic and televisions next door. No silence, no watching woods. For the first night since that encounter, I slept like the dead. The next morning, rested and refreshed, I was able to think more rationally again. Should I tell someone in authority about my experience? But who would take such a bizarre story seriously? I can already imagine a ranger or police officer struggling to keep a straight face as I describe the humanoid creature gorging itself by my camp. They get kooks all the time spinning wilderness tall tales. At best I'd get a patronizing smile and reassurance that I'd just had a run-in with a curious bear. No, speaking up will only make me a source of amusement for those meant to protect hikers and campers. Once word spreads, I'd be blacklisted from any group expeditions, banned from serious outdoors forums. I'd be just another delusional eccentric who couldn't handle being alone among the trees. After grabbing dinner at a nearby diner, I return to my motel room as dusk settles outside. No more camping out tonight. I'm sticking to the security of four walls and a locked door. I draw the curtains, shutting out the growing darkness. I clean up and brush my teeth. A hot shower helps wash away the lingering foulness and sweat from my time in the woods. Finally, I collapse onto the lumpy mattress, letting my exhausted body sink into the cheap polyester sheets. I take comfort in their artificial, chemical smell. Nothing at all like pine needles and rich soil. As I drift off, gratefully surrounded by the ambient sounds of traffic and televisions, I try to banish all memories of the trip. No more replaying those horrific visions. I just want blissful, empty sleep. A reset before heading back to my regular life tomorrow. Out there in the indifferent wilderness, mysteries still tread ancient paths not meant for human eyes. But for now, I just want forgetfulness. Each time I close my eyes, all I see are hellish glowing coals hovering in darkness. No matter how I try to distract myself, Exhaustion inevitably overtakes me, and then it's waiting. Those crimson embers, peering from the shadows. Even with legs aching and mind dulled, sleep brings no respite. The eyes follow me into fitful dreams, hovering at the foot of my bed or beyond the motel curtains, brooding and hungry. In my dreams, I try to run, but those flaming eyes paralyze me. Each time I jolt awake again, heart racing, only to reluctantly close my eyes once more as dawn remains distant. The nightly struggle continues until I slip into twitchy half-sleep, too exhausted to keep fighting, 
yet too unnerved to fully rest. As the first light finally slants through the curtains, I feel a little relief. I wake early after yet another restless night haunted by glowing red eyes hovering in the darkness. The thin motel walls and lumpy mattress provided little barrier against my lingering unease. Checking out well before noon, I load up my car, grab some coffee from the lobby, and point my car toward home. Maybe in the comfort of routine, the trip will begin fading into a dark dream. But when I blink, I still glimpse fiery eyes staring back from the shadows. Over the next few days settling back into my normal life, I can't seem to sit with my back to windows or dark doorways. My neck aches from constantly craning to peek behind me, convinced I'm being tracked by something just out of sight. At random moments, the hair on my arms stands up, possessed by the certainty of not being alone in the room. Whipping around, I find only familiar surroundings, the sofa, the cluttered bookshelf, the curtains wavering in the breeze. But I can't shake the prickling dread of an unseen presence, just like in the mountain pines. My rational mind scolds me for jumping at the shadows at home in my own safe suburb. Yet instinct continues pulling my gaze back to scan the darkened glass, peering out into the night pressed up against the panes. Some ancient animal sense is convinced the darkness conceals hungry eyes, quietly stalking familiar ground made alien. Every shadow and rustling leaf puts me on edge as I drive out of the rocky mountains. I startle at every whisper and flutter, primed for threats that never come. My next-door neighbor's wind chimes make my pulse spike until I register the harmless tinkling sound. Squirrels in the branches are surely rabid predators rushing to pounce until proven to be just foraging for nuts. The neighbor's tabby cat watches me warily from the fence, and I wonder if it also senses the lingering wildness I carry, the faint but unmistakable mark of an apex predator. Or perhaps it smells the fear radiating from me at all times now, sour and acidic. The cat sees a changed creature, flinching at things unseen. I try to relegate the paranoia to the rocky mountains fading in my rearview mirror days ago. But the suburban streets provide no more safety than the forest trails. Any shadow could morph into crouching demon forms or glowing eyes with only the passage of the sun across the sky. Darkness still conceals terrors, but no longer just in the wilderness. Once senses are awakened, they remain vigilant for the unseen everywhere. The first night back home, I awaken screaming, torn from a nightmare of being stalked through a moonlit forest by a skeletal creature. In daylight's reassuring glow, the memories seem less vivid, more like lingering night terrors than actual encounters. I almost convinced myself the whole thing was born of exhaustion and too much time alone in the quiet of the woods. But night falls again, bringing restless sleep and renewed visions. Glowing red eyes peer from the closet and beneath the bed. The creature perches atop the headboard, breath whistling as it salivates. I awaken screaming, unable to deny reality. Something uncanny found me out there in the untamed wilds and has followed me home. I replay the events in my mind, considering more rational explanations. It was late. I was exhausted and on edge after days alone. The fire cast deceiving shadows, distorting reality. My headlamp created phantom shapes in the darkness. The gruesome snapping and cracking were just branches falling or perhaps a bear foraging nearby. Letting my imagination run wild out there alone was understandable. But nothing supernatural crossed my path. I even chuckle thinking back on grabbing my little pocket knife against imaginary monsters. Watching too many scary movies clearly fueled those bizarre fantasies. Eventually, I fell back into my work schedule and daily habits. Soon, I rarely think back on those strange nights spent jumping at shadows and sounds invented by darkness. The trip takes on a surreal, dreamlike quality in my recollection. I chalk it up as a disorienting detour from reality, induced by too much isolation. Sometimes when I see a trailhead sign while driving or catch a whiff of campfire smoke on the wind, goosebumps still prickle my skin. 
A dull unease lingers in my animal brain, recalling those endless nights of dread in the pathless woods. But then, the civilized daylight dawns in my conscious mind once more, relegating monsters back to the realm of nightmares. I carry on, leaving that unsettling dream buried in the past. The creature visits nightly now in my dreams. Glowing eyes hover at the foot of my bed and beyond my curtains, radiating malevolence. No matter which direction I turn, its gaze follows. Sometimes the nightmare finds me wandering a shadowy forest, desperately lost until those hellish red eyes blink open before me in the darkness. Other times, the demon perches atop my bed headboard, talons gouging the wood as it watches me thrash and cry out powerlessly beneath the sheets. I awaken shrieking most nights now, soaked in sweat, unable to banish the visions seared into my psyche. As soon as I close my eyes again, the crimson orbs reappear as if imprinted on my eyelids. The nightmares motivate me to avoid anything triggering those traumatic memories again. No more solo camping trips or isolated activities far from others. I realize my mistake was tempting the unknown and unknowable alone in those remote mountains. When friends invite me camping, I make excuses. The thought of returning to the wilderness, removed from civilization's comforting streetlights and paved roads, fills me with visceral dread. I know those blood-red eyes still lurk among the trees, waiting for night's descent. Bit by bit, the disturbing events of that camping trip fade, details growing hazy with time. The creature's ghastly features and unnatural movements become harder to precisely recall. The vividness of its presence visiting my dreams each night diminishes. Weeks go by without thinking of the trip at all, my mind occupied by work, family, and everyday routine. Occasionally a news story about a lost hiker or camper gone missing in the mountains prickles my neck hairs, stirring a dull unease. But I push it down, writing it off as lingering superstition. Sometimes a night breeze causes the bedroom curtains to sway, casting looming shadows, and I freeze, heart racing for no clear reason. But by morning I've forgotten again, writing it off as tricks of the light, letting the comforting blanket of routine forgetfulness settle back over my thoughts. Outwardly, my daily life continues on as normal. Work, family, friends, hobbies. No one glancing at me would ever guess at the brush with the supernatural haunting my darker subconscious moments. I keep up a facade of normalcy. But sometimes walking alone down a quiet street at night, the hair on my neck prickles for no apparent reason. Despite determined efforts to consciously bury the experience, something fundamental in me remains irrevocably changed. I cannot stop reflexively scanning the tree line when I take the dog out at night, watching for shadows detaching themselves from the swaying pines. I may force myself to forget by day, but the night still brings an unease that runs deeper than memories. Some primal part of me is forever on alert attuned to the unseen predator that revealed itself, if only for a moment. It lurks at the thresholds where comforting illusion ends, always watching from just beyond the light's reach. I doubt that wariness will ever fully fade.